the food has been pushed into the uh, esophagus. The action is called swallowing. So the bolus is passing through the esophagus, connecting to the stomach. The esophagus is only the passage of food. There is no digestive enzyme that is secreted in the esophagus. The bolus is propelled through this esophagus by the process of peristalsis. Peristalsis is the wave-like motion of a bolus through the alimentary canal or through the esophagus because the bolus is only in the esophagus. What we have here is not a bolus. Okay? Now, let's talk about the process of peristalsis because it is the only process that takes place through the esophagus. To understand how the bolus is going to be propelled in the esophagus, I think it's important that we understand the process behind the propelling of food through the esophagus. Okay? We are saying peristalsis. Peristalsis, that is the process, okay, which takes place in there. Note that this process of peristalsis does not only take place in the esophagus. They are other throughout the alimentary canal here in the stomach, intestines, large intestine. We experience the same because this is facilitated by alternate contraction and relaxation of muscles. To understand what I'm talking about, let me draw how the muscles are arranged in the alimentary canal. But in this regard, we are trying to consider the esophagus so that I don't confuse you. So these are the muscles, the arrangement of muscles in the esophagus. So we have those muscles, they are called circular. These are circular, circular, circular muscles. Forgive my handwriting, circular muscles, okay. So we have circular muscles there, and those ones are longitudinal, longitudinal muscles. Okay, so those are the two different types of muscles. And these muscles, they are behind the process of peristalsis because they contract and relax alternately. Let me uh, come up with another drawing just to enable you to understand or to put you in a clear picture of what we are talking about. Okay. This is the longitudinal section of the same esophagus. We are saying the contraction, the alternate contraction, relaxation of muscles, this is what brings about the propelling of food in a wave-like motion, and that is the peristalsis we are talking about. Now, when you look at this one, it is still the same esophagus, except that this is a longitudinal section of the esophagus. So let's assume we've got the bolus, which is being propelled in that same esophagus. Here, where you can see where the esophagus has attained this shape, it's because the circular muscle has contracted. Where there was this, the longitudinal muscles, or should I say, where the, uh, the uh, esophagus has attained this shape, it simply shows that the longitudinal muscles relaxed. So these two muscles, they are antagonistic muscles and they antagonize, meaning when this other one contracts, the other one is supposed to relax. This is what peristalsis or this is what makes peristalsis possible. So the food will continue to be propelled through the esophagus by the process of peristalsis we have just discussed right here. So the food, until the food gets into the stomach. Before the food gets into the stomach, before the bolus gets into the stomach, the bolus has to pass through the circular muscle. So, I mean, has to pass through the cardiac sphincter muscle. The cardiac sphincter muscle, it is just at the entrance of the stomach. It is at the entrance of the stomach. It controls the intake of food by the stomach. That's what it does by closing when the stomach is full and it opens when the stomach is empty. Now, when the bolus passes through the cardiac sphincter muscle, definitely the bolus will get into the stomach. Now, let's understand what happens in the stomach as the bolus gets into the stomach. To understand that, allow me to draw a bit of a stomach which will help me perhaps to explain 
what I'm about to start explaining, okay? Whatever it is. This is the poor structure of a stomach. Note that this is stomach you are seeing here. It is the temporal storage of food. The food does not remain in the stomach for too long. The period taken for the food to remain in the stomach depends on the nature of the food. For example, if the food is rich in fats, definitely the food is likely to take about two hours in the stomach. If the food is rich in carbohydrates, the food is likely to take just an hour in the stomach. So the point we are trying to uh, make here is that the stomach is a temporal storage of food. So at some, uh, what is at some point, the food has to come out of the stomach. Now we are trying to understand what happens in the stomach there. Okay, the bolus has gotten into the stomach. This is the bolus getting into the stomach. Not that the bolus is the bowl of food. This stomach is made up of the gastric glands. Those are the gastric glands. The lining of the stomach is made up of the gastric glands. Okay. So what happens is that, let's look at the projection of the gastric gland. So this is the projection of the gastric gland. Let me draw it here. Let me draw it here to the best of my ability. Okay. Yes, this is a gastric gland. Okay. So this gastric gland here, it is made up of three different types of cells. We've got this cell, which is located just on top of it. This is called the peptic, the peptic cell. That's what it is called. Okay. Then we've got other cells in the deeper region of the same gastric gland. Okay. The other one is the what the the oxyntic, oxyntic what oxyntic cell. Okay. The third one which is also located in the deeper region of, of the gastric gland. It is called the goblet, the goblet cell. Okay, so this is the structure of the gastric gland. And the lining of the stomach is made up of this gastric gland. To understand what happens in the stomach, we need to understand these glands. Okay, first to start with, the bolus gets into the stomach. These peptic cells here, they are going to secrete the gastric juice the peptic cells will secrete the gastric juice. Okay, so we are here. So we are saying the peptic cells, the peptic, the peptic cells, they will secrete gastric, eh? gastric, okay, juice. So gastric juice is going to be secreted by the peptic cell the moment the bolus gets into the stomach. The gastric juice here contains two enzymes. We have Pepsi as one of the enzymes as well as release the second enzyme. So these two enzymes are the enzymes found in gastric juice. And the gastric juice is actually secreted by the peptic cells. Where can we find the peptic cells? The peptic cells can be found in the gastric gland here. This is the gastric gland, the projection of that gland. Because the lining of the stomach is made up of gastric glands. So this is the projection of the gastric gland. On top of the gastric, uh, gastric gland, we've got peptic cells and the peptic cells, they are the ones that secrete the gastric juice the moment the bolus gets into the stomach. The gastric juice contains enzymes Pepsi and Renin. What is the function of this Pepsi? The function of the Pepsi is to break down proteins into proteins into what? Peptides. Okay, proteins into peptides. Okay, that is the function of uh, the Pepsi. What about the renin? What is the function of renin? Renin coagulates carcinogen. Okay, so we are saying renin coagulates, coagulates, okay, carcinogen. What is to coagulate? And what is carcinogen? Okay, so to coagulate simply means to put together. Okay, putting together. Carcinogen is the protein that is present in milk. That's why the renin is the enzyme which is mostly found in young mammals, whose food is entire milk. So these are the two enzymes and their functions present in the gastric juice, and the gastric juice is secreted by the peptic cell the moment the bolus gets into the stomach. Now, there are also other cells because we talked about three different types of cells. We talked about the oxyntic cells. We talked about the goblet cell. Let's talk about the oxyntic cell. The oxyntic cell also, it is going to secrete the hydrochloric acid. 
this cell is going to secrete the hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid secreted by this cell has got its own functions as well. Number one, the hydrochloric acid kills the germs that which you might have swallowed to get out the food. That is the first function of the hydrochloric acid. The second function, the hydrochloric acid activates a pepsinogen to pepsin. At the point of secretion, pepsin is never secreted as pepsin because pepsin is the active stage, I mean active form. Now, it is secreted as pepsinogen so that it doesn't digest the glands here. So it is secreted in an inactive form. So the acid here, the hydrochloric acid, is the one that activates pepsinogen now to pepsin. So that's the function of the hydrochloric acid. The first one, I'll repeat, the oxyntic cells secretes hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid secreted by the oxyntic cells activates uh, what is pepsinogen to pepsin. That is the first uh, function. The second function, the hydrochloric acid kill the germs. Okay? Now, we are many with one cell. We have talked about the peptic cell. We have talked about the, what is the oxyntic cell. We have talked about, I mean, we are yet to talk about the goblet cell. Now, coming to the goblet cell, this is the cell that secretes the mucus. What is the function of the mucus secreted by this cell? The function of the mucus is to protect the lining of the stomach from digestive properties of the OCC of the acid. The acid produced can be very dangerous, can destroy the glands. So the glands are protected by the mucus secreted by this cell. So to understand what happens in here, you need to uh, take note of the cells okay, that are found in gastric glands. We know that the lining of the stomach is made up of the gastric glands. These are the glands we have shown here. This is the projection of it. It is made up of three cells. We've got this one which is located right on top. It is the peptic cell. Obviously, you understand that the peptic cell secretes the gastric juice and the gastric juice contains pepsin and renin. We have got oxyntic cell there which secretes the hydrochloric acid and the hydrochloric acid has got uh, its own functions as well as the goblet which secretes the mucus. The mucus. Now, the rhythmic contraction and relaxation of muscles because even the stomach is made up of circular and longitudinal muscles. As they contract and relax rhythmically, the food is going to be mixed with the secretion we have talked about. The food is going to be mixed with the acid, the mucus, as well as the gastric juice, the food which is in here. And it's going to be turned into semi-solids, porridge-like. So those are chimes, and the process by which those chimes are produced is called the churning process. Okay, so we have the chimes produced by churning. Churning is the process. And then the chimes will flow out of this muscle. This is the pyloric sphincter muscle. So the chimes will be pushed through the uh, pyloric sphincter muscle into the joint. Now, if we were to uh, consult back the diagram, okay, so we are going to have chimes coming out. Of course, by peristosis, like I mentioned when I was discussing with you the uh, process of peristosis, I did mention that it does take place everywhere. This is what digestion is all about. In the next video, we shall continue from here up to a uh, what is assimilation. We'll talk about absorption, we'll talk about assimilation, we'll talk about what happens in small intestines and in large intestines. Okay, we shall all discuss all those things.